So, well, first let me say thanks to the organizers for having this pretty amazing conference. You know, as Lisa was saying, that this isn't something that you know um, happens all the time. And it's also when I was reading one of the packets about the Center for the Study of Women and learned that it was responsible for the Think and Gender conference. It sort of brought it all home for me. In fact, was the first panel I ever did. Um, <laughs> it's a crass deal. And so it's just a pleasure to be here for multiple reasons. Um, you know, and sort of reflecting on what I wrote and also in relation to the other people on the panel, um, one of the things that I was trying to do that has, um, you know, caught my interest is to think about how so many of us uh, who, uh, you, know, you know, are trying to do interdisciplinary and critical work are also part of what we might think of as a kind of administrative reserve, you know, uh, in the sense that um, so many of us who, you know, do and work in various fields also then become the administrators. Um, you know, for our departments, for our centers, and, you know, and what does that mean, you know, in terms of, I mean, it's oftentimes how I think of tenure now, that tenure really means that you become part of a kind of administrative reserve, you know, you're enlisted into, um, you know, administrative possibilities and posts either then or for the future. And for me, that, um, you know, reducing the material conditions within which we have to learn how to speak, in different regions, um, you know, which is why I sort of, you know, tried to sort of make that the dominant, um, you know, theme in the position paper that I was working on. That, you know, I sort of, you know, as an administrator um, and as a chair in particular, you know, I tried to figure out okay, how do I sort of bridge the gap between, you know, being a critical intellectual being an administrator and um, recognizing that they're not the same thing, you know, like they're not. And um, they have different aims, but, you know, if, it, if we think of that as a kind of economy, um, a subjective economy, you know, how do I sort of make more of the intellectual part than the administrative part? <laughs> you know, so then how do you intellectualize the position of the administrator? And um, you know, so that's one of the things that's been uppermost on my mind. The other thing that I wanted to do in the piece was to, you know, we, you know Lisa mentioned the Jude Butler um, line, it's not a physical crisis only, it's also a crisis in the government. So, okay, recognizing that, then what can be my job, you know, when talking to deans? you know, the things and trying to sort of give, you know, deans better arguments about like why the liberal arts matter. And so, you know, those of you who, you know, were able to, uh, you know, read the papers, you know, saw that I, you know, pulled out uh, from that one of the um, sections from a recent or last year's budget request to the deans for my part. I'm just going to read that part in case, you know, if there folks who didn't. We were able to read it. Um, all right, so this is from one of my budget letters to my dean. All right. Um, yeah, well, we can't live. Um, you know, and, um, you know, and really sort of disturbed by, um, and I have to my recorded, um, disturbed by, um, you know, an argument that was circulating, has been circulating at the University of Minnesota but also seems to be circulating in other places too, and that is about the narrowing of the liberal arts. Um, and then also the sort of, um, you know, what seems to be a, a kind of contrived justification for the narrowing of the liberal arts. And so one of the things I tried to do was to, again, figure out, okay, what can you hear? You know, and uh, let me figure out what would be the sort of rhetorical elements um, for making an argument that could be Heard. All right, so here's, here's that part. In contrast to a vision of the liberal arts thematized around narrowing, can people hear? Yeah. All right, cool. Around narrowing them, there is considerable evidence that our contemporary moment is best engaged through a broadening of the liberal arts. We often think of the liberal arts as being marginal to discussions about politics and the economy, but upon closer inspection, we can actually see that the liberal arts have enjoyed renewed and reinvigorated interest. 
particularly in political and economic realms. Indeed, in his critique of No Child Left Behind, the Obama administration has pointed to the necessity of the liberal arts. Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan argued in a recent PBS News Hour interview, quote, we want schools invested in arts, history, sciences, languages, <coughs> and all the learning experiences that continue to, that contribute to a well-rounded education. Um, Contrary to the notion, in quote, contrary to the notion that the liberal arts are simply the poor relations of the rest of the university, the liberal arts are very often, very often subsidize the rest of the university through tuition dollars. This is not an absolute secret, but a public one that needs to be broadcast to media outside the university. In fact, it was, um, uh, this is from, partly from an article that an English professor here. Okay, yeah. Uh, but more importantly, <laughs> liberal arts colleges do not simply provide economic growth for universities. The liberal arts have produced the human capital needed for our information-based economy and can provide the necessary skills for citizenship in our global era. Indeed, we might observe the information-based economy as a defect of capitalist, humanistic, and liberal arts transformation. While the claim may seem far-fetched, much of the existing scholarship on universities and the economy suggests that such a transformation aptly describes the last 40 years of economic history. In the 1960s, knowledge of the broadest type became the definitive feature of the changing economy. For instance, Sheila Slaughter and Larry Leslie, in their book, Acting on Capitalism, write, quote, almost everyone today is aware that the knowledge and skills possessed by workers contribute to economic growth, end quote. In addition, Thomas Frank states in the conquest of cool business culture, counterculture, and the rise of, uh, of hip consumerism, uh, quote, American business was undergoing a revolution in its own right in the 1960s, a revolution in marketing practice, management thinking, and ideas about creativity, end quote. That revolution would yield what Richard Florida analyzes in the rise of the creative class, the creative economy, made up of scientists, designers, engineers, artists, writers, musicians, etc. Um, yeah, and so, you know, part of what I was trying to sort of get at and, and um, you know, persuade um, my view you know, into is that, like, look, we've also got to kind of reconceptualize what we think of as the last 40 years of political economic history, right? You know, if we're going to see the sort of salience of the liberal arts, um, you know, because so often, you know, what we sort of retreat to is the idea that the liberal arts teach, you know, they do teach creative thinking and, and critical thinking, and yada, yada, yada. But there's also a way in which we can tie that into the sort of transformations in political economy since the 1960s. All right, so that's one thing. Then in the paper, I want to argue against myself, right? You know, because like that can never be, you know, the primary argument for intellectuals, right? You know, the sort of basing um, the reason for why we exist on how um, it facilitates and contributes to. Political, the dominant political economic mode, right? And so um, in that piece, you know, in that section, I tried to turn to, um, you know, pieces that have been really meaningful for me for, you know, thinking about, you know, how, um, you know, our arguments about um, why we do what we do, you know, are best grounded in, um, you know, what George Lipsis and Lisa Lowe taught me in San Diego that it's about the reorganization of knowledge. You know? And the reorganization of knowledge is about the production of new communities. Um, so that you can't have one without the other, right? That if you're going to, you know, sort of reorganize along the lines of gender, sexuality, race, what have you, you've also got to have, uh, that necessarily means communities, you know, that, um, you know, have um, been engendered by those histories and uh, communities that will be produced in the future by those formations. And so, and so um, you know, which is why I sort of lean heavily on the Judy Butler uh, piece and that uh, Michael Rogan quote race representation from that uh, really wonderful article, <laughs> affirmative view about um, affirmative action as a kind of way to dream. Um, and, um, and I, you know, continue to think that that is, for me, um, what is primary, that it's about, you know, simultaneously the sort of reorganization of knowledge and the production and uh, of new communities and, hoping, <coughs> and holding the door open for new subjects. 